He does exactly what I do, but better. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. So look, Marvel's Secret Invasion was probably the worst thing the studio has ever made, and it really highlighted the brilliance of DC series The Peacemaker, because these two shows are actually very similar, but we think there's one scene that shows why one show was like this. It was perfect, perfect, everything, down to the last minute details. While the other show had us feeling more like this. Disappointed! So first, let's look at the many similarities between these shows. Each one had an opening intro that kind of blew up online. Peacemakers, because it was awesome. And Secret Invasions, because it was made with an AI that threatens to steal all of our jobs and livelihoods. Both shows also touch on a lot of the same plot points in some truly interesting ways. But it's how both shows tie together their storylines, character arcs, and themes that make them quite different. They each star a supporting character that was introduced in an earlier film in their respective franchises. The main character is an outcast among other heroes who struggles to connect with those around them. For Peacemaker, it's because of how he was raised, and for Fury, it's because of his discreet line of work. Along with their allies, this hero must go up against a group of aliens who can blend in amongst other humans, Invasion of the Body Snatcher style. These aliens see themselves as the good guys in their situation, but their intentions are misguided. One of the hero's allies is a member of this species that fights for the side of good and sacrifices themselves in a battle against one of their own kind. There's also someone who the hero initially relies on before it's revealed that they are also one of these aliens as well. And in the midst of these invasions, the daughter of a prominent character is torn between their loyalties to their family and to their personal beliefs. Now, since both shows are spy thrillers about aliens that can disguise themselves as humans, you would expect there would be a lot of intrigue and tension, and not just, hey, who's an alien? Who isn't? You just expect more complex secrets that each character would be keeping from each other, especially between the good guys. Like, the trailers for Secret Invasion promised us a lot of that intrigue and tension. I mean, like I've said, the Secret Invasion storyline from the comics is this huge, sprawling event involving a ton of different heroes who turned out to be scrolls. But making it into a small-scale spy thriller involving Nick Fury at the center had so much potential to be a tense, layered, paranoid throwback to movies like Three Days of the Condor, and from day one of the MCU, Nick Fury's been this calculating, mysterious figure, always being 12 or so steps ahead of everybody else and keeping his plans close to his vest. Tony pointed this out in The Avengers. What did Fury call us, and why now? Why not before? What isn't he telling us? Oh yeah, and remember when Nick Fury used Coulson's trading cards from his jacket to get the Avengers to work together, but then Maria Hill found out that the cards were in Coulson's locker and that Fury must have like personally dipped them into Coulson's blood? Yeah, that is a weird thing for Fury to have done, and he displayed no level of that kind of intrigue in this show. So look, getting a whole show filled with those kind of twists and turns sounded great on paper, but it really missed the mark on screen. Missed it by that much. And before we get rolling, I have something really cool I want to announce. Today, we are launching sweet new holiday merch at our merch store, Screen crushmerch.com where we design the shirts ourselves. Now, a lot of you remember our Doug Grinch ornament from last year, and now we have a Doug as parody of Hermie the Elf from Rudolph. I'd like to be a, a dentist. And we also have one of my new favorites, the Where He Goes, I Go shirt, showing the Mandalorian and Grogo riding across the sky on a bicycle like Elliot and E.T. This is in addition to this fun parody shirt, celebrating the return of Fraser Beast to the big screen. I'm listening. And right now, through Cyber Monday, we are running a 15% off all apparel at the store sale with free shipping on orders over $90. So pull your money with your friends and buy some shirts today. Guys, shopping our merch store is the best way for you to directly support our channel. We love making this stuff for you. It's so much fun. Thanks for watching. Now, back to what I was saying. So one of these shows had awesome scenes like this. And the other one had scenes like this. Holy God, what are you showing me? Hey, come on. And there's one very similar scene in each show that proves our point. Or what scene is that? The scene where we find out that Clemson Mern is a butterfly. So before we get to that scene, I have to talk about the buildup to that moment. When we first meet Mern, he's got a pretty serious, no-nonsense attitude and is dedicated to the team's mission. But the more we see of him in the first three episodes, you can tell that he's guarded, like he's got something to hide. At one point in episode three, we get this exchange between Economos and Mern. They say you've done, like, some real hardcore shit. I'm trying to do what I can to make up for my past. Which makes us think that he's had some kind of troubled past before working with Amanda Waller. But then we hear this. You've never shared any feeling? Nope. So that scene, along with the fact that he took a different impact from a bomb in episode three and walked it off, has us feeling... Suspicious. 
And then at the end of episode four, we're shown that he is in fact a butterfly. And this raises the tension because up till now, all the butterflies we've met have been evil. So we just assume that Mern must be doing something. He must be planning to betray Peacemaker and the others to further the butterfly's plans of world domination, right? Right. But then James Gunn subverts our expectations by revealing that Mern is in fact one of the good butterflies who broke off from the others that were led by the goth butterfly. So it's a twist inside another twist, like a Pepsi twist with a Band-Aid floating in it. Exactly, it's like a Pepsi twist with a Band-Aid floating in it. It's a great reveal, layered with mystery and building tension. And Secret Invasion never gives us anything near that kind of payoff. I mean, look what they did with how they revealed Rhodey was a scroll. Look how they mess with my boy. Now look, when Secret Invasion starts, Rhodey's working as an advisor to U.S. President Ritson. Fury gets in touch with him to tell him about the Skrulls infiltrating positions of power, and Rhodey just lashes into him, blaming him for the bombing and for getting Maria Hill killed, and then he fires him. To be able to sit across from a man we greatly admire, and to tell him without any reservation that he's fired. And sure, this is a cool scene that really lets Sam Jackson and Don Cheadle tear into some great dialogue, but we know Rhodey wouldn't act like that. It's pretty much spelled out for us in this scene that he is a scroll, which we've already been suspecting for years. He was number one on everybody's potential scroll list, just ahead of Eric Selvig. Oh yeah, that would have been cool. I know, right? But Rhodey's scroll confirmation was actually just a little bit later at the end of episode three. I, I need to speak to Graphic. Yeah, well, you're talking to me. Oh, wonder who that could be. Like, look, Don Cheadle isn't credited as the voice here, but this guy has been famous for three decades. We know what Don Cheadle sounds like. So this was the reveal, and it was so, so lame. This is a character who was with us since the first MCU movie. This should have been an earth-shattering reveal. Even the following scenes just kind of act like we were supposed to already know that he was a scroll. The scene with Priscilla. No, I'm sorry, correction. I DDT'd that dude from the top rope. And then with Fury in the hotel room. I can't have you running around spouting wild conspiracies, and I certainly can't have you breaking into my hotel suite. Even the shower scene, like, it's a cool visual, but it would have been much cooler at the, like, end of an episode. Like, imagine if Rhodey had joined Fury's team and Fury was relying on him, and then boom, scroll reveal. Boom, you looking for this? <laughs> so let's take this back to Peacemaker. We had only known Mern for a couple of episodes, and his alien twist had a huge effect because the clues were subtly laid out for us, and this made us question everything that had come before. And had they revealed that Rhodey was a scroll properly, it could have been huge for the MCU. I mean, this could have changed the way we saw Rhodey in all the other movies if it was revealed that he'd been a scroll practically the whole time. The whole time? Imagine though if Secret Invasion had started with Fury getting in touch with Rhodey about the scrolls and Rhodey had come on board Fury's operation and kept in touch with him throughout the show, letting him know about the president's state of mind and everything like that, and then maybe later revealed just to us in the same episode that Rhodey was a scroll. So now there's even more tension because Fury doesn't know that he's a scroll. Exactly what they did with the Mern reveal. The audience got this information first, which raised tension and stakes throughout the rest of the series. Maybe we could see Fury and Rhodey work directly together over several episodes, and then Rhodey's cover is blown. Like maybe Fury deduces that Rhodey is a scroll just because of something that went wrong in the field that couldn't have gone wrong unless someone on the inside interfered. That's some good sh Really, there were like a million better ways they could have done this than just like kind of dropping it on the floor for the rest of us to pick up. In fact, that's the main problem with Secret Invasion as a whole. For the most part, everything is pretty much spelled out for us. There's no surprises or extra twists or anything in this show. Even having shape-shifting villains never really became part of the narrative. Like that scene where Guy and Priscilla have to fight off other scrolls in a house and the scrolls just burst in through the windows instead of shape-shifting to attack them. Like, look, this is a spy thriller. There should have been layers Layers here, damn it! Layers! Like, look at how Adebayo is handled on Peacemaker. When she's first introduced, Adebayo is this friendly, awkward member of Team Peacemaker who sticks out like a sore thumb compared to everyone else. Ready to kick some ass, sir, and really looking forward to getting to know all of you. But then it's revealed that she's been secretly placed on the team by her mother, Amanda Waller. And it's not like she's playing a role when she's in public. Like, Adebayo is genuinely a good person. She wants to get out from under her mom's thumb and spend more time with her wife. She forms a bond with Peacemaker and helps him become a better man. Maybe you just gave us a chance to make our own choices instead of our bug overlords but she still has to follow her mom's orders or suffer her wrath, so she plants the diary in Peacemaker's trailer to frame him. And then she feels terrible about it. It's deep and complex, like Peacemaker's relationship with his racist dad. But of course, she does redeem herself during the final battle and makes up with Peacemaker. After Eagly, you're my BFF. 
and this affects the show's greater story. Peacemaker starts off the show a damaged man with no one to love him, and then after he bonds with the 11th Street kids, he suddenly finds a life worth living, and this is why he chooses to not allow the aliens to solve all the Earth's problems. Why did you choose not to help them? Because I knew they'd hurt you and the others if I did. What I'm saying is the connections that people make in Peacemaker, the show, those connections matter. In Secret Invasion, very little matters. What the f is this piece of sh so let's compare the story of Adebayo and Waller with Gaia, Talos' daughter, in Secret Invasion. Gaia should have been front and center in this show. We should have felt her struggle to both fight for a cause that she believes in, while also being faithful to the father she loves. These are like heavy questions, weighing honor and duty, family versus community, and the show did nothing with any of this. Like, I feel like Gaia spent the series staring off into space, waiting to get her powers for the big CGI fight that they'd already completed and paid for, and it was too expensive to scrap. Just think of the the missed opportunities with this character. We could have seen how Gravik recruited her to his cause in the first place, how he radicalized her and the other angry scrolls. We never even saw her question her allegiance to Gravik when Talos tells her that her leader had her mom killed. She's dead. How? Why did you ask? The people that you work for. Instead of immediately jumping sides after hearing that, we should have seen her find proof of this somehow. You know, like, because it's a spy show. Do some spy stuff. Or maybe she's loyal to Gravik up until he kills her dad, which then makes her switch sides and work with Fury. There was just so much potential for her in these plot lines, but the show is so rushed that we barely scratch the surface of what could have happened. But person, doesn't Secret Invasion at least have some kind of theme behind everything? I mean, not really. However, do you mean? Well, in Secret Invasion's defense, the Skrulls do have a good motivation for doing what they're doing. Fury promised to find them a new home, but he never did, and now a sect of Skrulls feel betrayed and are seeking revenge. But why didn't Fury find the Skrulls a home? That's the thing, bud. We never find out why. We don't? Nope. Well, let me explain. Throughout the show, we're never given a direct reason for why Fury didn't keep his promise. In the last episode, Gravit gives this great speech to Fury about how Fury basically used him and the other Skrulls to do his bidding before he just tossed them away. You put us out to work for you, and when you were done with us, you threw us away. And at first, it seems like Fury is remorseful for not finding the Skrulls a home. You, you're right, I, I failed you. I failed. He offers Gravik the harvest in exchange for him and the scrolls leaving Earth. But then the show reveals it's it's actually it's one misdirect that Gaia was actually disguised as Fury while the real Fury was saving President Ritson. So not only did Gravik not get any catharsis and he didn't get to give the real Fury a piece of his mind, but he and the audience never actually get an answer as to why Fury couldn't find them a planet. The show just ends without answering any of its main questions. Fury and his wife leave Earth a worse place than when he first came back and it all just had us going, Ow. What? Ow. The show is essentially about nothing. Oh, like Seinfeld. Yes, but not in a good way. But Peacemaker is a show that has a clear theme and executes it perfectly. As we mentioned, Peacemaker is an outsider. He's a misanthrope who acts like a dick because of his childhood trauma. That's the stupidest idea you've ever had. And it's offensive to me because I have a soul. But he yearns for friendship and for found family, which he finds with his teammates on the 11th Street Kids. This serves as a parallel to the show's main villains, the Butterflies. They too want to make friends with the people of Earth, but they do this by taking over their bodies and forcing humans to do things their way. They want to rob humanity of their free will, and these clashing views are explored brilliantly in the show's season finale. In the finale, Goff tells Peacemaker that they've seen how the people of Earth act, how they're on a path toward destruction. And she's empathetic here because they did these same things to their own planet. They're speaking from experience. Our kind traveled here from a planet that had become unlivable. Your planet had the habitat we needed. Water to drink and air to breathe. So their little bug hearts are in the right place. They want to take over people's bodies so they can make decisions for humanity. In their minds, this is for the greater good, no matter how many innocent people die. And this is what hits Peacemaker so hard because it's the exact same kind of vow that he once made. I cherish peace with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. But also, this ties into his childhood trauma of killing his brother and his lingering guilt over killing Rick Flagg. So the butterfly's mission makes him see that his own vow has actually made him a much worse person. So he chooses instead to kill the butterflies and their cow to save humanity, symbolizing the victory of free will over control. And this ending lines up with a theme that's in a lot of James Gunn's work. From the Guardians films to the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker, Gunn has explored misfits and outcasts, people who only fit in with each other. These people 
people fight back against those that try to control them or change them in any way. They fight back against conformity. And in this way, these outsiders do find a place for themselves in society, but among each other. Secret Invasion had no theme, or at least it couldn't pick just one. The show introduced all these interesting ideas, but never really cared about resolving them, and they just rushed to the climax without giving us a satisfying conclusion for the characters or even the story. Guys, that's just our thoughts on Secret Invasion versus Peacemaker. Big shout out to the writer of this episode, Mr. Cole Albinder. Let us know your thoughts on this down in the comments below or at either of us on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.